Hello, Monshin Sensei. Welcome to the podcast, Kazane Sound of the Wind. Thank you. It's so, so exciting to have you here. So uh, I've been attending the Tendai Buddhist services that you've been um, hosting for, I think, two months already, something like that. And uh, the reason I found you guys on, on Google um, uh -huh. was that I was doing some research on Tendai because um, I'm a Reiki, as you know, uh, Sensei, I'm a Reiki uh, teacher and practitioner. And as I'm deepening my, um, my studies on traditional Japanese Reiki, I wanted to learn more about Tendai, which I was not familiar with at all um, because um, Usui Sensei, the founder of Reiki, uh, practiced Tendai Buddhism. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm more familiar with, with Zen, which I was introduced to. Um, as a teenager uh, through Thich Nhat Anh's uh, teaching. So he really made this very popular, um, of course. So yeah, um, maybe would you mind introducing yourself and then we can go about, um, hear about your journey, how you got into Tendai and maybe the main differences with the other forms of Buddhism that are more widely known. Um, mm -hmm. I'll let you take the floor. Well, I'm not sure what, what you want by way of introduction, but I'll, I'll just um, do a very basic introduction, and then you can ask some more questions sure. about it. I'm <laughs> Monshin you. Paul Naiman. I'm the abbot of Tendai Buddhist Institute, which is the Tendai Shu New York Betsuin. And a Betsuin is a branch of the main temple, uh, Mount Hiei in Japan. Uh, and so this temple is the head temple for North America. Uh, and that includes Canada, U.S., and Mexico, as well as Puerto Rico and, and some other places. Um, and I have been here at the, we established my wife, uh, Tamami Shumon, is also a priest. And she and I established this temple 27 years ago. As a matter of fact, it will be 27 years next month uh, we will have been here. Congratulations, uh, that's amazing, yes. amazing. And, uh, and that was after living in uh, Japan for six years and I did all my training as a, as a Tendai monk in Japan. And I had been a Zen practitioner for 20 plus years before exactly. I was introduced to, to Tendai um, many years ago. And uh, so we established the temple here 27 years ago and we've been Initially, it was just a small little village temple, and that's all we wanted to do. Uh, but then, um, because of various reasons, uh, Tendai Shu noticed what we were doing, and they, some members of Tendai Shu called the Jigyodan, the, the Tendai Charitable Overseas Foundation, uh, came to find out what exactly we were, what we were doing, mm -hmm. and they liked it, and to make a long story short, they asked if we would become the uh, Betsuin, uh, which required me to then go back to Japan and do more training. Right. <laughs> I had done all the basic training in, in Japan before I left the Japan for six years, but then I came back. Anyway, mm. I don't know what else you wanted to know. <laughs> yeah, actually, um, I, I, we had a chance to talk and I was asking you about the process uh, in, in, with your training, which I found really, really surprising, uh, and some parts of it shocking and interesting. <laughs> uh, but before we go into that, can maybe just the main differences, let's say, between Zen and Tendai, and then how well, you got, you did that transition. I call it a transition, yeah. Well, let, let me just, uh, I'll, I'll answer that in two ways, one of which is to say the difference that I found and the reason I went from being a Zen practitioner, primarily a Rinzai Zen practitioner, is there's two major school, three major schools in Japan, Rinzai, Soto, and Obaka, uh, Obaku, I should say. And those are the major schools. I, I kid people, in the United States, we also have three schools, but it's Soto, Rinzai, and Macho. <laughs> because people say, yeah, well, I sit longer than you can. That's the Macho. Oh, my God. <laughs> Got it. But the reason, the reason I, I, I really went from being a Zen practitioner to a Tendai practitioner was I, I wasn't dissatisfied with Zen. As a matter of fact, I, when I first went to Japan, I would be in different Zen temples on different nights. Um, and um, 
I appreciate it. Once I found Tendai, I realized what I had been missing from my perspective. It's not a, that's not in any way to diminish what Zen does. It was just for me, right. I realized Personal that was what I was missing. But to, to answer your broader question, what's the difference between Tendai and Zen, et cetera? The big difference is that the Zen schools came out of Tendai. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> as well as the Pure Land schools. In Japan, oh. Tendai was established in 804 by Saicho. And the Zen, then first you had the Pure Land schools coming out. They were the founders of the Pure Land schools were Honen and Shinran. And they came, they were Tendai monks, and they started their own schools in the 11th and 12th centuries. And then Isai, the founder of Rinzai, and Dogen, the founder of Soto, were, Zen, were Tendai monks. Mm. And they took some of so each of the schools, the, the Pure Land mm. schools. The, the Zen schools took a piece of the Tendai teaching right, right, right. and started their own school, feeling that for the Pure Land schools, only the Pure Land, only Amitabha Buddha, Amida Buddha, is all one needs and faith in Amida Buddha and reciting the Nibutsu, Namo Amida Butsu, Namo Amida Buddha, Namo Amida Buddha, Namo Amida Buddha. That's sufficient. The Zen school said, well, we don't need all that esoteric mm -hmm. things. We don't need all those Pure Land things. What we need is just this form of meditation or that form Something, of meditation. Yeah. So the Zen, Zen schools in Japan came out of Tendai. They were originally Tendai monks. Mm -hmm. And they felt that, that Tendai, so that, and, and also I should add to that because many people may be Nichiren Buddhists. Nichiren was also a Tendai monk. And he felt that uh, teaching the Lotus Sutra the way Tendai did, which is a really very scholastic fashion, really didn't, wasn't required for the average person. They just needed to have faith in the Lotus Sutra. They didn't really need to totally understand the teaching. They just needed to recite the title of the, Lo of the Lotus Sutra, uh, which is what Nichiren Buddhism does. Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, right, which is right. a veneration of the, of the Lotus Sutra. Uh, Hoke being the Lotus. Uh, and so all of those schools came out of Tendai. So from a Tendai perspective, Tendai has the complete teaching. We do the meditation. We, have, we introduce pure land to Japan. We introduce meditation to Japan, what is now referred to as Zen. Uh, we introduced uh, the chanting as well as uh, esoteric practices. So, because so that's, thought, those are the differences. Thank you. Uh, I thought uh, Zen came from uh, China. From well, Chen... it originally, originally there was Chan, 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 Chan in China. However, it didn't go directly from the only school of of Chan. The only school of Chan that went directly to Japan from China was Obaku, and that wasn't until the 16th century. And so you don't practice different... Obaku. The, there, there are differences in, the, in how the Zen and how the Zen is practiced. Soto is shikantaza, just sitting, and Rinzai is practicing with koans. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting because Isai remained a Tendai practitioner for his entire life. Dogen mm -hmm. chose to leave Tendai, and yeah. he became dominant with the samurai, with the shogunate and the samurai mm -hmm. class. Mm -hmm. And that's why the center of of Zen in Japan was established in the 13th century um, in Kamakura, because that was where the shogun's headquarters was. And, and Rinzai uh, followed. And so they became, they became the legitimization of the shogunate, whereas Tendai had been associated with the imperial family, with the emperor. But wow. they, they're, they're supposedly, mm. allegedly, I should say, Dogen did go back to China to get further teachings. Oh, okay, okay. But historically, that's called into question. You know, oh. as a scholar, I can say as a scholar, we don't know, in oh, fact, that Dogen did go back to China. Okay. Uh, that oh. may have been, you know, post facto, so to speak. Now, now I'm speaking as a as a Buddhist scholar, not as a not as a right. monk per se. Right. Yeah. And so the uh, pure land is there pure land in 
China? There was. The, there was a pure land in China that started uh, in the, remember, Cha'an didn't begin in China until the sixth century under Bodhidharma. Pure land started in China in the, in the uh, somewhere between the, the third and the fourth century uh, in China. And so it developed in China early on. And it was again, uh, Saicho that brought Pure Land Buddhism to Japan. Um. And Buddhism is an integral part of Tendai. As a matter of fact, the Ojo Joshu, which was the foundation of what Honen and Shinran taught, is from Genshin, a Tendai monk from the 11th century. That's the basis for Pure Land in, in Japan. Because uh, here in the town where I live in the Philippines, there are a few uh, Pure Land temples, right? Uh -huh. And um, they're Chinese. They're like <laughs> right. <laughs> There's right. no so Japanese. There was, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, yeah, there was Pure Land. There was Pure Land in China for several centuries before either Chan or Tendai. Or ten, ten tai, to be precise. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That was wow. A, that was a relatively <laughs> early. That was a relatively <laughs> early teaching. Yeah. And and I would say that today in China, I think when we think of Japanese Buddhism, it tends to be very sectarian. You know, it, it you know your Soto Zen or your Rinzai Zen or your Jodo Shu Jodo. I would think Zen. In the past, I just thought Zen when I j yeah, Japanese there's, there, Buddhism. Yeah, there's different different forms. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah. actually. And actually, in Rinzai, um, Qi Gi, the founder of Tiantai in China, is one of the patriarchs of Rinzai mm. Zen, <laughs> as yeah. well as a as well as a patriarch of Pure Land schools. And so you had all of that occurring in China. Um, so today in China, you I, what I started to say. I'm sorry, I, I sort of got off the. Today in China, you have most of the Buddhist schools are associated with a combination of Pure Land and Cha'an and Tiantai and Hua Yen. Combination. Yeah. A combination. Uh, you don't, they're not really pure schools in okay. the sectarian sense that they are in, in Japan or in, mm. in Korea for that matter. They tend to be a little bit more sectarian in Korea also. Uh, but Tendai is the only one that does all the practices. Mm -hmm. So if you're a Jodo Shinshu person in Japan, you would never sit in meditation mm -hmm. as an example. And, and, the, and the, Rinzai, <laughs> the Rinzai people incorporate some of the Pure Land teachings because it was introduced to them through, the, through Tendai. Mm. You know? okay. But, but the, the reason for that has to do with something that probably people aren't going to be interested in. So I won't go into that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty okay. academic. <laughs> Actually, yeah, I would thank you for, for all that background uh, and, and the historical context. But I would really okay. enjoy hearing about your personal story again that, that you shared with me last time we spoke, in particular, how you met your sensei. I, I love okay. that okay. story. And then okay. after, if you can share a little bit about your experience um, Kind of, uh, I was asking you the process, right, to 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 become a priest, and you shared yeah. the physical aspect that I was really really surprised about. So, yeah. Well, uh, I'll start by just letting you know that I grew up uh, as an observant Jew, so I'm yes. Jewish by heritage. Yes. Uh, and <laughs> and and, I, and I, that's that's not inconsequential, uh, but I started studying Eastern philosophy, not just Buddhism, but Taoism and, and Confucianism, etc., when I was still in middle school. About the same time I was doing my bar mitzvah, I was studying Eastern philosophy. How were you introduced to that? Was it in the synagogue? I was, in the, I, was in, I was in the library one day, probably studying something I wasn't very interested in and started walking the stacks and saw Lao Tzu's Tao Te Ching and took it down. It and was like was somebody hit me over the head. Oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it just said, wow, this is really great, <laughs> you know, and so that's what got me interested. But then in uh, college, um, and remember, I'm, I'm 73. So in some time, I think it was probably 68 or 69. I had met a Soto Zen monk in uh, when I was in college. And uh, he was an interesting fellow. He was he was uh, in the States. Um, this was during the Vietnam War. And he was doing peace work in the United States 
and he couldn't speak any English and I couldn't speak any Japanese, but I would go and sit with him in the morning at five in the morning. Think about that, a college student going and sitting with a <laughs> Zen five monk at five o'clock at 5 a.m. Yeah, most, most of my friends were getting in at 5 a.m. Right, right. Anyway, so um, that was why I ended up in, in Zen initially because of that particular individual. And then later I was, you know, uh, not, I mean, I, I, I went to, to various Zen temples in the U.S., primarily Zen Mountain Monastery and Daibazatsu Zendo in uh, upstate New York. And, but when I was in Japan and, and my wife and I had been living and working in uh, Brazil. So I did medical research and I'd been doing that in Brazil and I won't go into the details, but um, in order to write some grants, I went to live with my wife's family. She and I went to live with her family in Japan. <clears throat> and uh, we were going to be there for six months and then go back to Brazil to do more research. But I met, so I would go to different temples on different nights to sit meditation. And one night I happened to see a, a public service announcement in the Japan Times, one of the, the English language newspapers in Tokyo that said tantric Zen meditation. And I thought, whoa, what? is tantric Zen meditation. I got to check this out. This isn't Soto or Rinzai. What is this, right? So I, I went and it was in this temple. The, te the name of the temple was Zen Yoji. Uh, and it's very close to, well, it's, it's in a part of Tokyo that's on the outskirts of, of Tokyo, the, of the downtown area. And, uh, but it's a very old temple. And it was one of the few temples that had not been destroyed during World War II, during the firebombings of Tokyo, partly because it was sort of on the outskirts of, of Tokyo. And um, so I went in there and I was going to have some, you know, normally uh, when you went to, a, when, if you go to a temple, you invited for tea and you sit and you have some green tea and maybe a little, uh, you know, sweet along with it. And, um, <clears throat> I, I went in and all the people that were there were people that I knew from other Zen temples that I had gone to. It was the same crowd. I mean, you've got a city of uh, conurbination of 40 million people, but there's still a group of maybe 20 or 30 people. We keep running, tripping right. over each other. Right, right. And these, by the way, were not just uh, Gajin. These were not just foreigners. These were Japanese as well as as. Um, non-Japanese people. So the Japanese uh, practitioners attended the same ceremony. They, uh, yes, they went, yeah. to the, they went to the same services, yeah. And so so I, I looked at it and I thought, well, you know, I'll, I'll see those guys tomorrow night at this other Zen temple that I go to. So I'll, uh, you know, and I had really very little idea about what Tendai was. I mean, I'd seen footnotes about it and references to it, but didn't really understand it very well. Uh, at that time. And so I went into one of the rooms where I presumed the, the, at that time, the Ichishima sensei, who was my master, my shisho is the Japanese term, and I would be his dosh. Um, he would give a lecture and then a meditation, and then everybody would go out to, to dinner uh, afterwards. And, and that was the, that was where we, what we did at most of the Zen temples also, uh, we would all get together and there would be a lecture, a discussion of some sort, and then there would be meditation afterwards. And, and then the temple wouldn't sponsor it, but all of us who had been sitting together would go out to an izakaya or some sort of restaurant and, and have a dinner. And uh, so I went into the room where the lecture was going to be, and I was just blown over by the beauty of the of that particular temple. It was unlike any of the other newer temples that I had seen. And uh, I mean, not not unlike, I mean, it was the same sort of style, except it was very old and mm. it was uh, very, very traditional looking. Uh, and I sat down at, it, at you know one of the tables on the tatami on the floor. And I'm just sitting there sort of looking around, being amazed by everything. And Ichishima Sensei comes in, this fellow who's dressed like this, and so I assumed that he was the guy who was going to be giving the discussion. 
And I said, uh, Sensei, um, can I get you a Zabutan, a cushion? And he said, oh, that would be wonderful. And I went and I got up and I brought him a Zabutan, a cushion over. And he sat down. We're sitting there. I'm just sitting there very quietly. You know, I, I'd only been in Japan at that point for about six weeks, probably. And, uh, but I knew enough to keep my mouth shut until I was spoken to by the sensei. <laughs> That's, that is something that you learn very quickly in Japan. You don't. You don't initiate the conversation. And so I just sat there. And then finally he looks over and he says, hmm, how long have we been studying together? And I thought, since I, I've, I've never met you. And he said, no, not this lifetime. How many lifetimes have we been studying together? And I, love this. You know, I just sort of looked at him like, is this guy for real? <laughs> to be honest with you, I mean, you know, Let's face it. I'm a New York Jew. What do I say? You know? <laughs> and I love so, that so much. and so, um, but what was really interesting about that is so that the night goes on. We do the, and I found that this, the discussion really interesting, and I found the meditation different than the kind of meditation that I was accustomed to doing at Zen temples, but it was still in the same ballpark. And but then after we everybody there must have been i'm going to say 20 25 people something like that but the temple paid for our meal at one of the izakaya and so we we're (laughs) we're finishing yeah well the reason the reason for that it's interesting ichishima sensei when he was asked to be giving he would do this once a month he would give the zen and tantric buddhist uh evening once a month at one of three different temples in tokyo and so initially they wanted to give him an honorarium for doing that, mm. right? And he said, mm. no. He said, all these temples are so rich and arrogant. I won't take any money, but you have to pay for everybody's dinner. <laughs> but that was his and, deal. Yeah. And so everybody went out to, uh, nice. we went to an izakaya, you know, a 10 minute walk from the temple. And, um, so we, we go there and then we're finishing up and I'm just getting ready to go home. You know, at that point, it's probably nine o'clock at night or something like that. And I'm getting ready to go home. And he comes over to me and he says, uh, Paul, why don't you, you know, there's a, a visiting scholar from the United States and there's a group of Tendai priests and we're all going out to uh, see this person. And I, I didn't know who it was i didn't recognize the name i think now was paul groner who's a very well-known tendai scholar uh in the united states uh he's emeritus at the university of virginia at this point but this was in 1989 so that was you know 30 plus years ago and um uh i said well yeah i i guess i can i can go i thought that would be interesting to go out with a group of tendai monks and see what they're up to and meet the scholar from the United States, but he didn't ask anybody else. And I, I said to him, he says, well, don't, don't you want somebody? He says, no, 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 we don't want a crowd. Just, you, <laughs> you just join us, right? So we go out and we, we went to a drinking place and, and <laughs> I was given the task of carrying some of the bottles of, of it was a kind of place where you bring your own okay. bottle and they do setups and they provide the food and that sort of thing. And um, with, there's many places like that in Tokyo. And Is it also um, sponsored by the temple. <laughs> no. it, well, the, I, I, I think the priests had all gotten together to, to do that. Okay. And, and, and the, uh, so we went and we had, a, we had a good time. And I, you know, I was basically quiet. I wasn't saying very much, but I was listening. And once in a while, I would chip in if asked a question. But then we were getting ready to leave. And I, to be honest with you, I had drunk far too much. <laughs> I, I definitely overdid it. And by now it's about 11 o'clock at night and we better get home soon because this train stopped running in Tokyo at a certain oh. time. Uh, so uh, at that point, I, I, Ichishima sensei comes over and he says, tomorrow you have to be at Taisho University <laughs> at two o'clock. And I said, sensei, I, I can't, I've got things I've got to do. I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm writing grants. I'm seeing people. I've got a life. You know, I can't just show up at two in the afternoon. He says, no, no, no. You have to show up at two in the afternoon. 
And so I showed up at two in the afternoon at Taisho University, ignoring all the other meetings I was supposed to have that day, of course. Remember, I'm, doing, I'm there doing research, writing grants. And um, make a long story short, he takes me in the, I meet him at the, gate, at the front gate of the university. He takes me in the administration building. And then he introduces me to the president of the university, introduces me to this professor, that professor. He takes me and he has my picture taken and we walk out of the, inter- out of the administration building. And I now am a student at Taisho <laughs> University, <laughs> a graduate student at I Taisho love this University. Story. <laughs> it's the best story. And, and he said, we better hurry because your class starts in 10 minutes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Wow, he's so, he was sneaky, <laughs> he was sneaky. <laughs> and so I attended Taisho University for three years. <laughs> wow. Uh, studying, but, and, and for people, most people don't know that Taisho is a university which, which is actually administered by five different schools of Buddhism. Mm. It's, it's, not, it's not dedicated to a single school, it's five different schools of Buddhism. And it's uh, arguably one of the most influential uh, Buddhist universities mm-hmm. in Japan, and they have students uh, who go there to become monks and nuns from literally around the world. Um, mm-hmm. Although it's primarily for the children of uh, temple families, so mm-hmm. that they can learn Buddhism and go on to become uh, temple priests. But you, yeah, in my classes, I would say that the majority of the people in the classes that I took were from Korea and China. Vietnam, Thailand, uh, Mongolia, uh, um, Russia. It was pretty amazing at, at that time, the people who were in, I was in the classes with. What about um, the percentage of Japanese? Oh, the percent, well, the percentage Japanese altogether was much greater. I much mean, greater, it was yeah. probably, it was probably, I'm going to say 75% yeah, Japanese yeah. and yeah, 25% yeah. non-Japanese. Foreign, yeah. But in many of the courses that I was taking, they, they tended to be a higher percentage of non-Japanese. In the and were the courses in Japanese? The courses were in both Japanese and English, in English. depending upon the course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was at the same time, I mean, I'd only been in Japan for six years. And I'd taken a, a Japanese intensive course, mm. you know, language intensive course. Uh, mm. And then I, while I was at Taisho University, I was taking Japanese language courses at the same time. Yeah. Okay. But, but interestingly enough, so um, in the courses I was taking were not just Buddhist courses. They were also um, Japanese history, Chinese yeah, history, culture, yeah, et cetera, yeah. culture yeah, courses. Yeah. 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 So before um, we move on to my second favorite story of your of your training, um, <laughs> can you? So I don't. Your uh, your sensei was teaching tantric Zen. Is that it? Well, he was no, giving he, a talk he, on t- tantric t- Zen. Well, actually, one of the courses I took was a course on tantric Zen. What is tantric uh, Zen? Maybe that's a better question. <laughs> what it's is it's a, it's es- it's esoteric practices. Okay. Now, I have to be careful here because he was teaching the theory behind that. You can only mm-hmm. you can only learn it if you're ordained, which I'll get to in, in just a moment. So you can learn the theory behind it in a but college the practice classroom, in itself. But you can't learn the practice itself until you've been ordained. And so um, tantric Zen is the use of mudras and mantras and visualizations as a way to attain awakening and to um, help others in their awakening. But specifically, it's in Japan, the two schools of Buddhism that practice are, the other term in, that's used in, in uh, Tibetan would be Vajrayana. Is it Vajrayana related to, in, um, to Mikyo? Mikyo is, that's exactly what Mikyo is. Oh, okay. Mikyo is a Japanese term. Right, 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 right. The Indian term is tantric. Oh. And in English, oh and in gosh. English, and in English, we would use the term esoteric. Oh wow, that's like makes sense now. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That makes sense. And, and so and so when I, I so I studied at Taisho University for three years, and then I finished my I finished a program uh, equivalent to a, a 
graduate program in um, uh, Buddhist studies at uh, Taisho University. And, uh, but in order to do that, I actually did not go back to Brazil. We were supposed to go back to Brazil. I won't go into why that was, because I think that's a long story in and of itself. But I ended up getting a, I became a research scholar at the University of Tokyo. And so I was attending classes at Taisho University at the same time that I was a research scholar at the University of Tokyo School of Medicine, continuing my research. And I switched my research from doing work in Brazil on women and child's health and parasitic disease, called schistosomiasis, to working in Japan, looking at women and children's health, specifically looking at well health of children from different social strata in Japan. Uh, that, was, that was my research. And so, but after three years, I finished the course and I said to Sensei, you know, I really feel like now maybe I should actually study the practice of Mikio. And he said, well, to do that, uh, why don't you come to my temple? One, he has, his family has five temples. Why don't you come to one of my temples? We don't have a priest there and you can stay, you and your wife, um, Shumon can stay there. And when I told my wife, she said, what? She's <laughs> Japanese. And she said, we're going to do what? We're going to live in an 800 year old temple in Chiba? Are you crazy? Now, my wife is a professional translator interpreter. She was at that time. She was a professional translator interpreter. And she worked with the Canadian Embassy and Shimizu Corporation and, and Disney Corporation and you know, big concerns like that. Nice career, yeah. <laughs> and, and, but all of a sudden I said, no, we're moving out of Tokyo. We're moving to Chiba. <laughs> and we moved into a temple that did not even have flush toilets. <laughs> oh, she must have been so happy about that. <laughs> oh, well, she was pleased. And the only way to get to the temple was to go across rice paddies <laughs> and then up it. the hill. <laughs> I love it. Uh, but it was an 800 year old, at that time, it was 800 year old temple. And um, we moved in on Ohigan on the uh, um, spring equinox in uh, 19, I'm trying to remember the year now, 1992. And then, so I got there and I said to Sensei, okay, now we're going to start studying Mikyo stuff, right? <laughs> uh, and he said, well, you've got to be ordained first. And I said, well, okay, but what do I have to do once I'm ordained other than study, you know? And he said, well, nothing. You just, you, just, you just have to get ordained. But in order to do that, we've got to go out and we've got to buy you the robes and we've got to buy you this other paraphernalia because if you're going to be ordained, you've got to do that. And I said, okay, you know, and, and we did. And, you know, I went with him to downtown Tokyo to one of the shops that sells those things. And, and we, I was outfitted and uh, go back. And then I would meet with him every morning at 5 a.m to begin to do translation. And so he and I worked on translations every day. That was day part from, of your training. That was part of my training yeah. to work on translations from 5 a.m. to 7 a.m. And then, then I did Shido Kegyo, the training for the esoteric teachings, Mikyo, uh, which has to be done at one fell swoop. Uh, and I did it uh, in the summer. And, but in the interim, my wife and I are living in a temple and then Ichishima sensei would say things like, oh, by the way, I've got to be busy today. So would you please go and those people who are going to come to the temple, would you lead them in the heart sutra? And I said, oh, sure, I, I can do that, you know, and, or, to, you know, uh, by the way, uh, I have a funeral to do. And uh, they asked me if they would bring that strange foreigner from my temple to assist me at the funeral. And so I said, I, okay. Well, the next thing I know, I've become a priest. I mean, it, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't actively go out to be a priest. You just, just wanted to of, do the, the esoteric just, stuff. Yeah. But the next thing I know now, and if I, you know, in Japan, if you are uh, the, a temple priest, often your name, my family name is Naaman. So instead of calling me Naaman-san or Monshin, which is my Dharma name, they would call me Tamonin-san son of Tamonin. Tamonin was the name of the temple. Right, and my right, wife right. became Tamonin Oksan, the wife of the temple, right, uh, right, etc. Right. So 
slowly and but everybody knew me in the village as the temple priest <laughs> at that point but that's but that's how really it happened and when um, my wife and I were ready to, to leave Japan uh, after being there for about six years and I'd been at the at the temple for a little bit under under three years um, then uh, I was planning on going to Portugal. I had a job in Portugal. My background is biomedical anthropology. And I had a job in Porto, Portugal, teaching at a university in Porto. Um, my Portuguese is okay. So, you know, and I was fortunately, I would have been able to teach in English anyway, but I, my Portuguese from being in Brazil was, Brazil. was okay. And um, my sensei said, no, no, you, you really shouldn't do that. You should go back to the States and start a temple. <laughs> so that's why we came to the States and started a temple. <laughs> Such an amazing, epic story. I really love it. Thank you for sharing it with me and, and everybody. Thank you. Um, sensei, can you share a little bit about, because I thought that was also amazing, the, the physical aspect of your training. Like I, I had no <laughs> idea that, that it was so intense. Um, you shared a little bit last, last time we spoke. Yeah, well, I, I think that people, people have to understand, I think, two things to begin with. You know, when you think about uh, monastery, monastic life, and you picture monks walking around quietly, uh, sort of, uh, you know, patiently, um, and you imagine that there's a lot of study, mm. like a seminary, mm. you know, you contrast exactly. it to a, a Christian seminary or something yeah. like that, where you're spending time studying, contemplating, and praying and yeah. contemplating and all those things. Well, on Hiezan, which is where you train as a monk, um, on Hiezan, which is the, the center for uh, Tendai Buddhism. And keep in mind also that Hiezan itself is still a wilderness area. At one time, there were over 3,000 temples. Today, there are still hundreds of temples, but the mountain area is broken into several different areas, but it's wilderness. And what, by wilderness, I mean that there are bears, there are boars, there are snakes, there are monkeys. <laughs> And they're, you know, they're during bears. training, mon monkeys will be throwing rocks at you, things like that. And um, yeah, there's <laughs> there's really bears and boars and snakes and things. And because it's a wilderness, there, you're not permitted. I mean, they cut down it's trees. It's a protected area, yeah. It's a protected <clears throat> area, much much like in the United States, you'd have as, let's say, a national park. Right, right, that has right. the same sort Got of it. status in Japan. And um so the, um, the other thing to keep in mind is that from a Tendai perspective, Tendai is a very scholastic school. We are expected to really study uh, a great I, deal. I realize that now. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very scholastic school. However, and, and that's considered to be really part of, of being a Tendai monk. Um, and then you, you, you learn the various things, but the training is broken into two parts on Hiezan itself when, a, when you go there to train. I did the Shido Kegyo portion with my sensei, with Ichishima sensei, uh, when, we, when I was a Tamun in the temple I lived at. However, in order to be the abbot of a Betsuin, I had to complete the first portion, which is called Zen, Zengyo. So the second portion is called Shido Kegyo, that's the esoteric the Mikyo portion, and then Zengyo is the other portion. And in that portion is where you learn how to walk, how to chant, how to do Shomyo, a particular kind of chanting, how to uh, do the services, you know, that, that, that we do. And however, from a Tendai perspective, it's not something that you intellectualize. It's something that you have to learn physically. Your body has to learn it, not your mind. And so it's called, it, the, the, the term, it, when we, we shorten it to gyo, but it's really shu gyo. And shu gyo means body training. Gyo mm. means training. The term gyo means training. Shu gyo is the way of translating would be body training. And so it means that to begin with, you're never permitted to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> 
that would be tough for me. <laughs> You're just told, here's what you do. It, it, by the way, one of the, the greatest paradigms, I think, between um, Japan, I, I, I wouldn't even say Japan, I would say East Asia. East Asia, it's true with China, it's true in Korea, it's true in Vietnam, as well as Japan, is the difference between the paradigm of how and why. In East Asia, the, everything is, is oriented toward how to do something. Outside of East Asia, it's oriented to why do you do something, right? But stop and think about it. That's a really important, that's a really important difference. You as a Reiki practitioner have to learn to let go of the why in order to do Reiki. If you're concentrating on why, you're not going to be concentrating on the energy forces that are arising in the body that you're trying to uh, work with. I mean, that, that's, my, that's my take on it. You know, you, you might disagree with me about that, but that's, that's my take on it. But Sensei, where does, um, where does, how about intention? Where does intention fit in? Well, intention is very important. Intention Isn't is, that is the really why? vital. No, intention is not necessarily the why. Intention can come from the why or the how. In other words, my intention is to do it the best I can. I'm not doing it because of a reason. I'm doing it the best I can in spite of the reason. You, you mean regardless me. of the reason? <laughs> regardless, I'm going to do it the best I can. But going back to the training, so the training is very is very uh, physical. Physical. The first For day, the you know, the, when you enter when you enter into the gyo, the, the first you enter in in the afternoon, and the af from that moment on, you're not permitted to leave Mount Hiei for the next two months. You can't months. leave at all for two months. And so you have to, you have to be there not, and you have to sign a contract that you will not leave under any circumstances. And you can never go back if you were to leave. You can't do a do-over as it were. And so, to, so you, that's, the, that's the first thing to keep in mind. And now you, when you're there, you arrive at let's say two in the afternoon, well, typically two in the afternoon is when you, you have to be, they begin doing things at two o'clock. You might arrive at 10 or 12 or something, but they begin doing things at two. And the, from two o'clock until, you know, that evening, it's like an orientation. Mm -hmm. Here's the rules. And they just spend the, the day, you know, like any, like going to any institution like that. Here's the rules. And then the first thing, the first full day of training is a kaihogyo which is essentially a marathon running down the mountain, around the base of the mountain and up the other side. And it's about 40 kilometers. That's how long it is. And it's down the mountain and up the mountain. And the mountain is 800 meters. So imagine doing a marathon, but you're going down a mountain and up a mountain. You're not just on the flat and you're running. And you stop maybe altogether four or five times. You have to stop certain places and do, do certain prayers. Um, and otherwise, that's the first day is a marathon. When you finish the marathon, think about in, in the Philippines, you do a marathon. What does everybody do? They go and they go someplace and they have a beer and they yeah. eat spaghetti or whatever, right? Yes. yes. Um, no, you finish, you finish doing this and you go back and you do work. Right, right, right. literally chopping wood and so you start doing the this marathon of the first day you're not permitted to sit down and put your back against a chair you're not permitted to sit in a chair at all everything is in seiza the only mm -hmm. time that you're permitted to not sit in seiza is when you're sitting in meditative posture and or when you're sleeping in your in your futon <laughs> And when you go from one place to the, to the next, you have to run. You're not permitted to walk. So what's the idea behind the running? The running is that life is, you know, the, the evening gata is, um, now I've got to remember what the evening gata is. Uh, let me respectfully remind you, life and death are of supreme importance. Time passes swiftly, die, and opportunity is lost. Do not squander your life. Awaken. 
<laughs> so Don't the urgency. squander your life. The urgency. The meals that you eat, you're only given about 10 minutes to eat your, your breakfast or your dinner or How whatever meal. How can you eat mindfully? <laughs> well, what is my... When you use the term mindfully, yeah. you're thinking about it in the Western context. Yeah. Mindfully in, in Buddhism is shmirti. It means that you are concentrating on the teachings, all that. That's what mindfully means. Mindfully in, in modern jargon has no reference to that. You, you, you can talk about being mindful and not be Buddhist, right? Yes, yes. Mindful in Buddhism means shmirti. It means to be cognizant of the teachings at all times. Oh, the in all your interactions. It goes back to the teachings. It's, everything goes back to the teachings. And so the reason that you don't walk, I mean, you walk when you're processing into the, into the hondo, into the temple to do the services and things like that. But during regular activities, everything you're, you're running all the time and you're not permitted, to, like I said, you're not permitted to lean against a chair. You're not permitted to, um, well, to, to, to put it another way, during the Shido Kegyo portion, uh, my wife who did it on Yezon said that in the last week of Shido Kegyo, she only had about nine hours of sleep because Why? she was either because for Why in a that? week. Why is week, that? Because you're either actively doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're eating, you're cleaning, you clean all the time. You're the first thing you do in the morning when you get up is clean the floors then you're cleaning, it uh, you, you, depends upon where you're assigned that day. You might be cleaning in the temple, you might be cleaning the dorm, you might be cleaning the bathrooms, the kitchen, whatever. You're cleaning, you're doing an activity like there would be a class or there would be a practice, you're doing meditation, you're doing chanting, you're doing something. And no time should be left for you just to sit and think. The object of, Shio, of Shugyo is that you are continually working your body to remember what you're supposed to be doing. Let the mind go. The, the mind is in the moment, so to speak, of what do I have to do right now? I'm not thinking about, if, if I might think about if I'm, let's say in bed, and I might think about, well, I have to get up at, at uh, 2 a.m., uh, to, to do such and such, but that's the only time that you're thinking ahead. <clears throat> you, you are concentrating on what you're doing right now. That's not called mindfulness. That's called practice. <laughs> that's the practice. And so you're continually, you're continually uh, working in that, in that fashion. I don't know if I'm answering all, all of your mm, questions. Mm, because I'm, I'm wondering about, you know, you just mentioned the very first day out of the two months where you had to run that sort of marathon. And I'm and just you, and wondering- And you do it the last day also. You do it the first day and you do it the last day. I'm just trying to understand, like, uh, is it a sort of hazing or is it like- No, it's not at all. It's not at all. I mean, when you're doing the, the Kaihogyo is called, is called running meditation. You are concentrating- Running totally. Meditation. You are concentrating totally on stopping certain places and doing prayers. I know it seems it's so out of character for what people think about Buddhism, but it's also out of character for, for what we think of uh, in the West uh, and in a postmodern world as to what life should be like. But the point is that when you're doing that, that there are people who do a thousand day Kaihogyo. They do a marathon a day for a thousand days. And during that period of time, they spend nine days. I think it's in the, they do it over a seven year period. So it's 100 days the first year, 100 solid days the next year, then it's 200 days and 300 days. There's, there's one period of time in which you do two marathons a day when you're doing a thousand, two oh marathons in one day. You actually run into Kyoto and back. Uh, during the, the thousand day Kaihogyo. And during and that period. An, like an offering or, or what's. You're doing it. You're doing it to as a meditation. As a meditation. You're doing it as a meditation. 
and with the ultimate doing... purpose to attain enlightenment. Awakening. Awakening. Awaken. Yeah. And so going back to the thousand day meditation, there are approximately 250 stops along the mountain route that they do. And they'll stop and they'll do a quick mudra and mantra and visualization. And then they'll just keep on going. So they'll stop 200, approximately 250 times uh, during, during that. But that thousand day meditation is just one of the a uh, thousand day Taihogyo is just one of the practice. There's a 12 year meditation. There's another 12 year uh, period where you, the, the person, the practitioner is expected to be chanting uh, continuously like 18 hours a day. So there's many extreme practices like that. And so, um... Sensei, like somebody has to be really physically fit in order to do the, the training, right? Yeah. Like what happens yes. if they want to be, uh, you know, heading a temple and they don't have the physical, you know, like just they're not. Physically... That's a problem. It's a problem. Oh, okay, <laughs> That's, okay, okay, okay. That's a problem. So it's a requirement to be fit. Yes. Physically. Oh. Yeah. I mean, I, I had been as, as a young person, I was a runner. And so for ah. me to go, I, I did, I did the first, I did the first Kaihogyo when I was 52. Oh, wow. My first Kaihogyo, I was 52. Wow. And, but, <laughs> but, but you I prepared had been, for that. You trained for well, that. Well, I, I had been, I mean, I used to run, you know, uh, 20, 30 kilometers a day anyway. Mm. Okay. So, so you really cut, cut out for this job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, so to speak. She must yeah. say really like <laughs> picked well, but. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, thank you so much. It's, um, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, and I okay. also wanted to take some time to ask you a little bit more about the Tendai Buddhist Institute in it's upstate uh -huh. New York, right? It's yeah. a, yes, we're about a, uh, a little bit over a two hour drive from New York city, from the city. and about yeah. two and a half hour drive. We're right. We're located <laughs> right on the Massachusetts border oh, okay, uh, okay. in the Berkshire mountains, in the Berkshire mountains. Okay. Oh. So uh, also a lot of wilderness little, there <laughs> we we are where we're located is in a little notch in the berkshire hills and uh, we have 110 acres we have 110 acres of land and our our temple was an old horse barn that we took down piece by piece and reconstructed uh on a different foundation uh, using all local materials so beautiful. It, yeah, it, there's a beautiful uh, image of it. Uh, behind that's right. You, yeah. That's right. I'm, I'm sitting in front of the image of it. Exactly. Yeah, the, of the interior of it. Yeah. Quite beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, so, and um, so, go ahead, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, so uh, we are still a village temple uh, and we're very involved in the, in the community that we live in. Uh, I was on, uh, I'm on the ethics board for the town of Canaan, which is the town we live in. Uh, I'm on the uh, environmental sustainability board for the town, um, but it's a village temple insofar as the local people, it's just their local temple, yeah. uh, as well as being the head temple for North America. So we also administer, Temple Buddhist Institute also administers uh, California Tendai Monastery and a number of other temples around the United States and Canada and Puerto Rico. And then you have a stray from the Philippines. <laughs> a stray from the Philippines <laughs> who joins us on Wednesday exactly. evening. Do you have other, people from other countries or am I the only one? No, no, no. There's many people okay, from other okay. countries. So yeah. you're really open. I mean, because you mentioned you're a village temple, but you're also international yeah. in that sense. We, we are. We are international. So we have yeah. people that join us, not, you know, from Germany, from okay. France, from Japan, from to Philippines, right, right, Colombia, right, right. Okay. Uh, Mexico. I've been, okay, I, I've been getting, you yeah. know, I've been getting so much from, from your teachings and I, I really uh, want to thank you for that. And um, so well, is it you. okay to to invite people to join a session Any, sometime? Anyone is, anyone is is welcome to join oh, us. Thank you so I much. I think one of the things, just very, very quickly, one of the things about Tendai that is different from the other schools also, and I should have mentioned this, is that in Tendai, there is no one method that is useful for everyone. Some people, the best thing to do is meditation. Some people, the best thing okay. to do is 
calligraphy. Some people, the best thing to do is chanting. It depends upon mm -hmm. the individual. Uh, and so we're very open to anyone and, and we have many different methods uh, to do that in the same way that in Japan, the different temples are dedicated to different things. Some temples are, are really dedicated to pure land. Some are dedicated to mikyo. Some are dedicated to, to meditation. Uh, some are dedicated to outreach, to working, you know, with uh, young people or elderly people or whatever. So that's, that's characteristic, characteristically Tendai. Yeah, that's a very uh, interesting point that I, I wasn't aware of. And so how do you find out what's best for you? You have a teacher. You're with a teacher, okay. And you ask your teacher. Mm -hmm. That's how you find out. Because the teacher should be your best friend, not in the sense of your buddy, but someone who can be on, you can be honest with and someone that you can be honest with and tell that person what you really think, what was really happening. And then as a best friend can tell you what you really need objectively, not to please you, but knowing who you are, what you need. But in a guru, guru sense. In a guru sense. Guru sense, yeah, yeah. 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 Fantastic. Yeah. All right. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it's been it's been a pleasure. And it's a pleasure to see you every Wednesday night. <laughs> Thursday morning. I always look forward. Thursday to morning for you. Thursday that's morning. right. Wednesday night for me. Thursday morning for you. <laughs> so I'll see you then, Sensei. Okay. And um, thank you. Thanks again. And be well. Be well. <laughs> bye bye.